Africa. In doing so, he felt he had a natural advantage over rival Liverpool criminals. He was black. We could go to Africa, Asia, Jamaica, and either know somebody or have a relative there or family roots there, as I did in countries in Africa. I could go there, I could buy, I could put it on a ship, and 10 days, turn around, it could be here in Liverpool, container could be taken off. By going to Africa and importing cannabis direct, he dramatically increased the supply of drugs. A ton was nothing. I mean, we started off with a ton, but a ton was nothing. And you multiply, by that time, you're talking about 300 pound a pound. You work out the value of a ton. If Shower's figures are accurate, a ton of cannabis was worth nearly 700,000 pounds in the 1970s, millions today. Showers was growing very wealthy and didn't care who knew it. I remember at one time, I, I, was, I was away for, I think, I think it was around about six months uh, in, different, in various countries. And when I came back to England, um, I was given my proceeds and I think that week I bought a Rolls Royce cash, a house cash, another house for a member of my family cash. That's the kind of money. Michael Showers was living proof big money could be made from drugs. Yet while some criminals took note, others still saw robbery as the game to be in. Charlie Seeger demonstrated how the Liverpool villain was always on the lookout for the next opportunity, whether in Liverpool or beyond. It was getting a bit hot for me in Liverpool. Um, so I thought the best cure for this is out of sight, out of mind. So I bought myself a beautiful cottage and I met this guy over there, over in Wales, where I was, and he was an antique dealer. And he said, there, I know where there's a fortune to be made in this game. So of course you listen, don't you? Charlie Seeger needed little encouragement. He began robbing the country houses of North Wales of their antiques. There's two types of different antiques what we used to go for. And antique dealers know this saying. You'd either have the smalls, we call them the light removal business, that's the silverware and the jewellery, or the big stuff. Seeger couldn't keep his new enterprise secret from the police for long. He said I was controlling all the antiques in the northwest, Charlie Seeger, this, this, that. Oh, no, 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 there's a lot of people at the antiques, but I was involved with the antiques and I'm, we made plenty of money at them. Seeger was never caught stealing antiques. Though he has served three jail sentences, faced countless charges including murder and gained the nickname Killer, Seeger has received no convictions since the mid-60s. Yet as Seeger lived his charmed criminal life, his hometown was entering perhaps its bleakest decade. On the 3rd of July 1981, the Toxteth district erupted into an orgy of violence. It was the worst public disorder Britain had witnessed that century. And young robber Stephen French was at the heart of it. I was toe to toe with the old enemy. Yeah. At last, the playing field had been levelled. Yeah. And we could have a pitch battle. It was so emotional seeing all these police officers from literally all over the, the, the north of England coming out with heads bandages, arms in slings, on crutches. And I'd never seen you know, police officers attacked in the way that they were because they'd had bricks thrown at them, there'd been petrol bombs, they'd been attacked in the street. It was absolutely frightening to see it. They bust them in from all over, put the lads from St. Helens up front. Yeah, right. They got slaughtered. We slaughtered them. 
For three days, the authorities lost all control over Toxteth. Estimates suggest up to 1,000 police officers were injured and as many as 140 buildings destroyed. But why? It was a combination of the social deprivation, the lack of opportunity, the nowhere, and the getting pushed around all the time. In 1981, over 40% of young men in Toxteth were unemployed, and official reports identified this as the root cause. However, some police officers felt underworld leaders took an active role in fermenting the riots. In the build-up to those riots, really the main person or people um, that we were concentrating on was Michael Showers and his brother Delroy Showers. We as police were causing them a lot of problem with it within Topsit. So they, you could see there was a build-up of, of public disorder, disturbances, really to make the police keep out of there, to say, keep your nose out of here, we want to carry on our drug dealing. Whether by accident or design, the riots did create a no-go zone for police. Out of Toxteth would come one of the richest criminals in British history. Yet the hard drugs revolution on Merseyside would not come from Toxteth, but the other side of the Mersey. And it caught everyone by surprise. Mike Malloy was a police inspector on the Wirral, the peninsula across the Mersey from Liverpool. And in the early 80s, he was coming across increasing numbers of heroin addicts who had all been sold the same lie by dealers. The lie was, if you chase the dragon, which is smoking the heroin through the, the fumes, through the silver foil, you can't get addicted. And, and these people fell for it. And within months, we had an epidemic. Between 1979 and 1984, burglary trebled. The Wirral's main town of Birkenhead earned the nickname Smack City and became known as Britain's number one heroin black spot. In 1984, Mike Malloy led a unit to find out why, and the answer began several years earlier in Liverpool. Armed robbers in the 70s were particularly active, and our, our job was to tackle armed robbers. And we did it, and did it very, very successfully. So like anything else, crime is a business. It has to evolve. So they decided, somebody along the line, somebody decided, let's put our money into drugs. And that's what they did. These Liverpool armed robbers had very good reasons for setting up business on the other side of the Mersey. It's like the old mafiosi, you don't do it on your own doorstep, but you do it on somebody else's doorstep. And as I say, because there was no really hardened criminal gangs on the Whittle, they weren't frightened. They thought, well, who the hell's going to retaliate from the Whittle? Whilst there were no hardened gangs on the Wirral, the gangsters eventually found themselves up against Mike Malloy's new unit. It took us 12 months, the first 12 months, to climb that ladder. But we not only smashed it to a certain extent, we also put away the guys behind it, the guys who had set it up. That was the first organised, shall we say, cartel that started. Because of our actions, they had to go somewhere so it turned back on itself, and Liverpool got the problem, which it still has till today. The established criminals causing this problem would become known as the Liverpool Mafia. The Liverpool Mafia were white middle-aged criminals who worked on the docks. They were experts at smuggling contraband. They made a lot of money from armed robbery, and they were able to invest that in drug shipments. Career villain Charlie Seeger watched many of his peers dive headlong into the gold rush. I know a few of the lads what got involved in drugs, the old school. Good lads, but the money was so plenty to me, it was a source after commodity. 